<laughs> Welcome everyone. This isn't really a spooky costume, I guess, but hey, I'm trying. I got the, the bony hands with room for my fingers to play. Hopefully, it's, it's actually pretty tricky to play with gloves on. And this is my, uh, my complex costume that I have on for today. I appreciate you guys joining. Uh, it's hard to see here. Uh, I'm Phil and you're watching Playground Sessions. We've got a fun lesson for you today. We're going to be getting into the Halloween spirit. And that little riff I made up in the beginning there was trying to set the mood for this haunted, it's a haunted lesson, let's call it that. I want to say hi to Gemma Drew Anderson. Hi Gemma. That's my daughter and uh, she's watching from home. You guys, she loves Halloween. It's crazy. Uh, I'll show you some pictures after we do our home uh, our home Halloween party. No, no real trick-or-treating this year, unfortunately. But we're gonna have fun today and I want to kick things off with a pop quiz because I want to give you guys a chance to win some free song credits today. For those who are new and are just joining for the first time, we like to give free song credits away for our interactive app. And those could be applied to any song in the song store and you could download uh, without paying a cent. That's what the free song credit does. And so I like to ask questions, and I want you guys to put your answers in the chat. Whoever gets the first correct answer wins a free song credit. And I'm in a giving mood today, you guys. This is like the candy for your trick-or-treat bag. I'm going to be giving away more than usual today. So here is pop quiz number one question. There are a couple of different kinds of chords. When I say kinds, I mean like major, minor, quality of chords, okay? There's a particular chord that I've talked about before in these live lessons, and that is an especially spooky one. What is the name of this kind of quality of chord? This is just all one chord, but I'm playing it sort of through inversions and all that. But here's the basic form of this chord, and I'll invert it. And you might even think about an old uh, silent film, right? It kind of has that suspenseful rolling chords. Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea like to play diminished, two different diminished chords on top of each other as one chord voicing, and it's pretty gnarly. Check it out. Uh, which ones do they do? <laughs> you whole step above. Exactly. That's it. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew keeps me honest. All right. I'm seeing a couple of. I'm seeing a lot of correct answers in the chat. I love it. Look at this. The first correct answer goes to Chris Vance. What up, Chris? For those who don't know, Chris is Playground Session CEO. So, Chris, you do not win a free song credit because I'm pretty sure you have unlimited song credits. But thank you for participating. Everybody say hey to Chris Vance. Sarah Pickles says dim. That's short for diminished. And that is absolutely correct. And you guys, since this is trick-or-treating time, I'm going to give three free song credits for this pop quiz question. Sarah Pickles gets the first one. I see... Dorian Minor? No, that's not Dorian. Um, you're close because we were talking about Dorian last week. But that particular chord is a diminished chord defined by having the same interval between every note, and that's a minor third interval. It's all minor thirds. So Sarah Pickles, Robert Atkins, and Charles Smith, you guys win a free song credit here for pop quiz number one and if you I believe you guys have all won in the past but if you have not and you're new all you need to do to redeem your free song credit is to email support at playgroundsessions.com and you will win um, I want to give some honorable mentions to Lily May to bless Lord to uh, to Camille to Joe Kuser, uh, and to Biker J, eleven hundred, Jeremy Shilly. Good job, everyone. I love seeing good participation in the chat. All right, so let's learn our first song. 
Um, we're going to get to Thriller, but in the meantime, there's a little... <coughs> oh, excuse me, let me get into character here. I want to teach you a theme. A theme from Batman. Let's take a look at the notation. So, first we can see the right hand <laughs> starts with A and D. We then drop that A to A flat, and then down to G, and back to A flat, and we repeat that pattern. By the way, I should say, this is the old Batman theme, not the new one. <laughs> and, we, and when we have the left hand in as well, we get... Now, I only included the first two measures of this riff, but if we take it around to the different chords. First we have D. Sorry guys, I can't talk in this voice anymore. <laughs> that was actually longer than I expected to go. So here's what we're doing. D minor. And in our right hand I want thumb and pinky. Now look, two finger is ready to play this A flat. And then I bring my thumb out and I play G. Now, this same pattern can be applied then to the four chord, and that's exactly what happens when we hear this song in its entirety. So then we go up to G, and we do the same thing. Then back to D. We can do it up to A, G, D. Check that out. Pretty cool, right? So you wouldn't think that that would be the fingering suggestion here because your thumb seems to be doing double duty and moving maybe more than you would think it needs to. But when you have something like this, it actually makes a lot of sense because of the height of your fingers to have something like this. Your thumb is very, it's very easy for your thumb to move in and out like this. Now the alternative might be to put your third finger on A. But to me, when I have that gap between three and five, it kind of bends my hand unnecessarily. Uh, and so I'd rather see a relaxed hand and have my thumb move. Now, I mentioned that, actually Aiden, come back up to, uh, <clears throat> come back up to me. Uh, <clears throat> you see, the new Batman theme is quite a bit different. The new theme focuses on a chord motion from the minor one to the flat six. Send me back to the notation, Aiden. And that's exactly what we see in the final two measures. This is my kind of brief arrangement, but what we see here is this D that then resolves to this B flat major. And David Sides, if you're watching, this is a shout out to you because David's, first of all, David's favorite composer, uh, oh man, I'm spacing on the guy's name, that composed the new Batman. Oh, uh, now David's gonna roast on me for this one. Uh, it's like the number one guy. Zimmer. Zimmer, thank you. I believe Hans Zimmer did the new, the new theme. Um, and maybe I'm wrong about that, but. Okay, well, regardless, I, what I'm thinking of is that one of David's favorite uh, scores, movie theme, movie scores, comes from that modern Batman uh, uh, theme, which is, again, defined by, you have a minor one, which then resolves to the flat, major flat six. So in this arrangement that we see on screen, I thought it would be fun to... Um, 
to kind of call, start with the old stuff and call upon the new stuff. So here's the pattern once more. And anyone with your keyboard on right now and, you've, and you're sitting in front of your keyboard or piano, I want you to try this with me, okay? Um, notice we have D on top, that's also our bottom note. Now let's imagine the notation extending here, moving that whole thing up to G. So G on the bottom, G on top as well. And then back to the D one again. Now we'll go up to A, G. Now here's a chance for an extra bonus song credit. Anyone in the chat, tell me where you may have seen that chord progression before. One. Four. One. Five. Four. One. And then from here I like to have a rest, a dramatic rest, and then play that major flat six chord after all that. That's my homage to the new Batman theme. So, does anyone know where that progression sounds familiar from? One, a one, four, a one, five, four, one. Anyone know? And I'll give you a hint here in just a second. I'm gonna let you guys type. And here's, here's your hint. Is anyone writing? They all say thriller. Thriller? Yeah. Oh, someone got it. Nice. Kevin Murray. Kevin Murray. What did Kevin say? 12 bar blues. 12 bar blues, baby. That's right. And at its simplest form, it's one, four, five. Uh, and so that's not really a blues per se. But in the way that we saw it in this Batman theme, that's actually really what they were doing, that old kind of blues progression. Um, so, good work. What's the name one more time? Kevin Murray. Kevin Murray. You win a free song credit. Good work. So, that's a little bit of Batman, and I think we should keep things moving here, you guys. Um, let's chat. Uh, I'd like to introduce another teacher into the mix for today. Um, brand new to the, to the world. Um, it's a foreigner. Um, but we're going to bear with him here, and we're going we're gonna to learn a theme... Again, we're building our way up to Thriller, which we started last week. But I'd like to talk to you guys about a little theme that's kind of about me, about this guy here. Maybe you know it. X-Files. Any fans of the X-Files? I'd love to show you a brief little excerpt from that as well. So let's take a look at the notation. So, man, this is harder than I thought, you guys. <laughs> so what we're seeing here is just a four-bar arrangement of the main theme here. And I added a little bells and whistles there to kind of spice it up, but this is a more accessible version. The left hand might look a little bit intimidating because we see a lot of eighth note triplets there. Uh, and the tempo is quite fast, and, w and when, when it's performance time, right, it's like triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. That's pretty quick. We don't have to learn it at that speed, though. In fact, we shouldn't. We should slow it down. So the challenge here is going to be in the left-hand part, and many of you might actually appreciate this. 
the left hand part on its own acts as a really nice warm up and a strengthening exercise for your fourth finger, at least how it's arranged here in this key. Uh, and so I have it down here, but I'd like to bring it up an octave actually. So here's what I'd like us to do. Five on A, four on middle C, two on E, and one on F. Everyone get your hand up and try that with me here. And you can try and play it as a block chord first, or you can do this, kind of play them and hold them as you go. I want you to see all four of those notes as one shape. And what we're gonna do rhythmically is we're gonna play the first four notes and then it's gonna offset. Triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. So that's it, that's the pattern. One, two, three, four. And then that pattern actually continues into the next measure, still playing F at the beginning. Then, and of course I like to use the sustain pedal here to make it sound dreamy and otherworldly. And that's it, so let's go super slow, uh, and let's play all of what we see in the left hand here, all four of these measures. Ready? Try it with me now. Two, three, go. Triple it, triple it, F, C, E, F, C, keep going, one, two, three, Four. Now start with A again. Next measure. Now let's talk right hand theme here, you guys. I also have this in the wrong range too. We could do it here, but it might be better to throw it up here. A. E, D, E, G, E. So stretch your hand out, your bony skeleton hand, and put your thumb on A and your pinky on G. Let's start with the outer range there, the outer notes. And then we're gonna fill in, and I'll leave this up to you. Depending on your hand's shape and size, you may wanna go one, three, uh, let's see. You may wanna go one, uh, one, four, three, or you may want to go one, three, two. I'll leave that up to you guys. But here's the melody, ready? Four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now on its own, pretty easy, pretty simple. But when we add in these triplet rhythms, it can be very challenging. So let's try it super slow. Here it comes, I'm gonna slow things down. That's great, and I love this left hand riff for a few reasons. One of them is that it leaves such an open space because you don't put the bass note, that A, back in it in the second measure. So you take that idea, if you did this, it doesn't sound wrong, but it's a bit busier. And from an arranging perspective, I think it's really nice that the bass, the low note, doesn't really drop in uh, as often as it could. It's more sparse. Uh, and so the effect you get, especially when that right hand melody comes in, you kind of get the effect of like, ooh, we're kind of so we're out in open space, kind of, and I don't really know where the bottom is or where one is. That's a really effective trick to get uh, the feeling of like a spooky emotion or a scared emotion from a listener. Let's try it again. I'm going to speed it up a little. Right? And then you can get that bass note back in there. 
Super cool, right? That's a fun one. Any X-Files fans out there? I remember watching it uh, when I was really young. Um, and my mom was a fan. And uh, yeah, it kind of got me into sci-fi stuff. Uh, and I think that's pretty cool. Anyone else? Um, Anyone else want to get in the thriller? I know that's what we were advertising for today, and I know that's why many of you came. So, I think we can get to thriller now. And, you know, I tried really hard to get a thriller costume, you guys. No luck. Um, I think the reason is because they had a killer makeup crew, and they everything was makeup. But he was more or less like a cat monster so we're gonna go with that he, i'm a cat this is my thriller costume and we're gonna get into some thriller if i can see the notes that is kind of important here i think we can work with that so let's take a look at the notation here for thriller and this is a uh, sort of a modification of the arrangement that we worked on last time. I don't have the verse in the notation here, um, but what we're doing is getting more into the chorus. And again, this is just a snapshot. Um, if you guys really want to learn more of Thriller, and I think we do based on the last couple lessons, then I'm going to look to get this full song arranged in the song store so that everyone can dig in with interactive feedback. And you guys could even use your song credits that you earned today to download Thriller. And in fact, I think it's time for another song credit. So we're going to look at this Thriller notation here. And I'm going to ask you guys a quick one, all right? First, first correct answer wins. Second measure. In the right hand, we've got some chords. What is the chord we see on beat two of measure two? What do we see on beat two of measure two? First correct answer gets a free song credit. I'm going to go ahead and play it. That one. Checking on the chat here with you guys. I am seeing, oh, I'm going to catch up here. What's up, everybody? Sarah Pickles in the house. Nice, with the alien emoji. Good, good. Hey, John Sandlin, late, better late than never. Charles Smith wants to learn more about 12-8. Oh, nice. We can talk about that in a minute, maybe. I still want to get into some thriller stuff, but I want to know if anyone believe we have a correct answer. The correct answer is John Sandlin. Yes. Well, that's not the answer. John is the winner. The, winner. Uh, <laughs> the answer is not John Sandlin. The answer is G major. So I'll break it down for you guys here. Uh, the chord I asked about was not this one, not this one. It was this one. It's a bit of a passing chord in this specific instance because it's quick and it moves us between but it is an important one and in fact here's another opportunity for a song credit I told you guys I was going to be giving them away today why is G major important in this key of D minor it has to do with modes and we talked about this last week in our in our thriller lesson what about the key of D minor with a G major chord, or another way to say that would be a natural six? That's what's special about this G major chord. It contains that note. So my question is, what mode are we in if we have D minor, but we have a, a, a natural six in the scale? It's important. Let's see if anyone's got it. 
Andrew, keep me honest here, because I am not sure if this is up to date yet or not. Do we have a correct answer yet? We do. We have four correct answers. Oh, cool. Yes. We do. The, okay. Who are they? Robert Atkins. Robert Atkins is a winner. Dorian mode mm -hmm. is the answer. Who else? Jeremy Shilley. Jeremy Shilley. Charles Smith. Charles Smith. Oh, he, John says the fourth. It is the fourth of that of that chord. Yeah, yeah, uh, of that key. So uh, those are the four correct answers that we're going to go with now. I want to keep things moving, but all four of you guys say it one more time, Andrew. Robert Atkins. Robert Atkins. John Sandlin. John Sandlin. Jeremy Shilley. Jeremy Shilley. Charles Smith. Charles Smith. Free song credits. Boom. There's some candy for you guys. By the way, let me know in the chat what's your favorite candy. I saw a hilarious Butterfingers commercial the other day. And uh, it was like speaking directly to me. It was talking about if you, if you steal Butterfingers out of your kid's candy bag and you have to like turn yourself in, like you're like getting arrested. So, it sounds stupid, but the commercial was funny. Uh, Butterfinger is mine and I'm a fiend. A oh, <laughs> Andrews is Three Musketeers. Also, by the way, say hey to Ian Krause, everyone. Ian is the newest member of our support team. Also a musician, also in the Akron studio. Give it up for Akron and say hey to Ian. He's joining us today and working with Andrew out of the Akron office. Um, all right, so where were we? Uh, let's get back to Thriller because I want to teach you guys uh, the next bit of it. Here's my quick arrangement of this chorus and it looks like this. Something like that, okay? So that's enough for us to bite off for one lesson. And um, let's go ahead and talk about the left hand first. So as we know, last time we learned this part. And I like to do it in octaves, but you don't have to. And I wrote it in the notation just as single notes. D, F, F, G, D. Okay, the next thing I have here is a block chord outlining G dominant 7. And yes, I want to call your attention to the fact that that is a big strong G major chord in its triad form. When we add the 7th, it becomes dominant. But that major 3rd there is that important note to define do the Dorian mode here. So we go here, and then in the next measure we're just moving that B to a B flat which is a really nice change because of how much we were focusing in on that Dorian natural sixth, right? Now we're flatting it briefly, and that will lead us back to D minor. So I'll show you an action, ready? And then we're back, right? Now here, same idea, G7 in the left hand. And then we get to this really cool syncopated part here. All right, let's talk about that. So our left hand drops down to, uh, to a B-flat-7 shape. We're just going to play the B-flat, and it's flat-7 uh, for now. And that's the bare-bones voicing. Up here, and the melody is going to cover the other notes of that chord. So the root, the flat seven, the third, and the fifth. And then left hand drops to a G7, but we have a different set of notes in the right hand. This is kind of an altered G7 sound. So we go A flat to F. And then you can voice this next thing in however you want. I have it as basic C and then D minor but I also like to drop it down and do fifths, like something like that. Um, also, I should add that there are more syncopated 16th note rhythms, um, but I simplified for this arrangement because I want to move quicker through it and not, not spend too much time working out tough rhythms. And once you have these shapes and this form down, it'll be a lot easier to add in some of those syncopations. For example, Uh, 
stuff like that, the things that MJ is doing vocally. Uh, but for now, I think it helps to just see it in a more basic form. So there we go. So let's take a look at the eighth measure on screen one more time. We go left hand drops to B flat and A flat. Rest, C, D minor. I just have this written here afterwards because again I want to highlight that uh, that G major So we talked about that last time, and hey, do we still have that graphic from last time? Maybe not, and that's okay if we don't. I'll just show you that bass line here. That's the iconic bass line here for, for this tune. As we talked about last week, we're D minor, D Dorian. But what's cool about this bass line is on the downbeat, it starts on C, then walks to D. A one and two and three. One and two and three. And those little extra syncopated guys there, you can you can leave them out for now and just focus on the one and two and three, four. One and two and three, four. A one and two and three, four. A one and two and three, four. One and two and three. Try it with me, guys. One and two and three and four. A one and two and three and four. A one and two and three. Now, what I like to do with that is to go back and forth in the right hand between this chord and this chord. And as we know, that's D minor seven. That's the one chord. This is G major. That's the four chord. <coughs> Excuse me. And so check it out, that bass line still works underneath both of those chords. So that bass line is really fun, and you can keep that right hand part going. Any singers out there? Who's trying to learn this song so they can sing along while they play piano? versus who's trying to learn this song to play as a solo piano arrangement. What we see on screen is more about playing the melody in the right hand, right? But we could also just focus on the chord version of that, which would be Right? And you can hear the melody on top of that if you're singing along. Um, so I'm going to check back in with the chat real quick and see 
how my people are doing. Got some questions. Got some questions? Good. I was going to ask. Uh, so let's see here. I'm going to get to Charles' question. Charles Smith was asking about 12.8. Um, and let's go ahead and talk about that. So 12.8 is a time signature. Uh, and if we were going to literally uh, discuss what it meant, it would mean 12 beats per measure and the eighth note gets the beat. So there are 12 eighth notes in the measure. But I would not say that it would be the right move to count that like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1. Yes, that is right, but there's a lot of numbers there, right? we got to go all the way to 12. It can be confusing. And so instead, when we have a time signature like this, I think it's important to think about the larger beats. If we can zoom out a little bit, typically 12-8 feels like 4-4. Four, four. And in fact, the X-Files example is kind of a good example of that because it's all triplets in the left hand. So every beat in that 4-4 four, four actually has three eighth notes where there should normally be only two, right? That's what triplets are. And in fact, why don't we pull up the notation for X-Files again because that will help me answer that question. Um, if you take a look at the first measure, Charles, just left hand, right? You have triplet, 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 triplet. Now, instead of thinking about that as 4-4 four, four with triplets, let's instead think about all of those triplet eighth notes as one eighth note in a 12-8 measure. You would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That could be 12-8, but we wouldn't count it like that. We would actually still kind of feel it like we would if it was written how we see it here. We would still feel it kind of like one, two, three, four. Um, and what we're doing when we say that out loud is we're saying one and we're counting three notes out into one. So there's a group of three, that's one beat. Another group of three, it's beat two. Another group of three is beat three. Another group of three is beat four. Uh, so 12-8 um, often is, is felt that way, if that helps. Um, it's divisible evenly into four, and that's the key here. Um, it's four even beats with three eighth notes in each. Um, so I don't know doing it all for my baby, but uh, what's like a classic song in 12-8? Um, like... Um, I don't know that one either. Um, often it, you'll hear people talk about bembe, a bembe rhythm, which is a kind of a famous 12-8 feel. Um, but... Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know that one either. A lot of times you'll hear it in a, bl in a blues, though, like an, a, a slower blues will be, will be a 12-8. But really, that just means like a super slow swing, like one, two, three, like that. Um, good question. So let's move on to another one here. Uh, and let's see if I can see this through my mask here. Uh, <laughs> I think the next question is from Lily May. Lily May asks, are there any tips on keeping the right rhythm when you have different melodies in both hands? Oh, Lily May, what's up? Yeah, um, that can be tricky. Syncopated rhythms between the hands, how do we keep an even timing? Well, you may have noticed in Thriller, maybe not because you can't see my foot, but I was tapping, uh, I was tapping along to the pulse, the quarter note. So that can be fun just as like a syncopated practice, but my foot was very directly keeping the pulse. And that can be challenging to do. That's something actually that you may need to practice on its own. And you could practice that by, again, removing a challenge. There are always several challenges 
present when you're working on something. So if you want to work on one specific challenge, try and strip away some of the others. And Lily, what I would say is, take one hand and tap your foot. Then do the same thing with the other hand alone and your foot until you can do it easily. If you can do each of those individually, then it's time to try it hands together with your foot. But again, I would take away the challenge of full tempo at that point. And of course, when you can do it at that slower speed, then you can speed things up gradually. But any other specific answer I could give, Lily May, would have to, I would have to know exactly what, what part you're looking at, what piece of notation. But it typically will always come back to stripping away the extra challenges, slowing things down, and that's it. Honestly, that's half the battle. Um, what else do we got? Elta John. Do you recommend practice with one hand at a time? <laughs> Perfect segue back to what I was just saying. I always recommend that. I'm kind of moving fast through some of our notation excerpts today. So uh, forgive me if I moved a bit quickly and jumped into both hands at the same time. But in general, as a general rule, always one hand at a time when you're learning something new. Unless, of course, the challenge that you want to be working on in that moment is your sight reading skills. And if that's the case, if you're not trying to learn a song for later, but you're trying to actually read it for the first time and work on those skills, then you probably want to have your hands up and trying to sight read it. But otherwise, definitely one hand at a time. Again, strip away the extra challenges. Focus on your challenges one or two at a time when you can, instead of five or six at a time. Woo, it's hot in this mask, you guys. Oh, happy Halloween. <laughs> Let's keep the questions going. Joe Kuser asks, uh, don't keep us in suspense. What's our follow-up to Prelude and C? I'm itching for another challenge. Joe, I'm so excited about this next challenge. I'm going to give you a hint because I can't tell you what the whole experience is yet. But I want to give a hint because someone actually talked about it in our last challenge. One of you guys, I forget who was saying that they wanted to do something holiday themed before it was Christmas time, right? We can't start learning a Christmas song on December 20th. And some people were saying, oh, it's too early for the holidays, but not if you have to learn a holiday piece and you want to perform it before the holiday season is over. So that's all I'm gonna say, I've said too much. And uh, <laughs> it is going to have to do with the holidays, it's gonna build us up to that holiday season, but there's a special surprise with what we're going to teach, as well as who is going to be teaching. It's going to be some of me, but I'm going to have some help as well from, uh, from another teacher or two. So I've said too much again, uh, but I am excited to, to share something and share the excitement. Keep your eye out. It's going to be soon, you guys, I promise. Robert Atkins says, so what would be the major difference if you sang with it versus playing solo? Great question, Robert. Um, I did mention, do you want to do full solo piano version or just the accompaniment version, the thing you would play while you or someone else is singing, right? So uh, let's talk about those differences. The main difference, and this is important, if you're accompanying someone and you're playing, even if you're accompanying yourself, if there's a separate instrument or voice that's taking the melody, you don't want to play the melody in your piano part. That's a crucial step to this. Solo piano, that means it's only you at the keys. So you're going to be doing bass, you're doing chords, and melody. All of it. When you're playing for someone else, you got to leave room for that person to do their part. That's 101 for accompanying, okay? Um, and so what that means is we're going to remove the melody from what we're playing. And 
the second consideration would be to leave room in the range for the melodic instrument. So if the melody is up here, then I'm not going to be playing my chords up here. I'm going to be more down here. That way I'm a little bit more out of the way of the melody. Uh, but it's actually a bit, it's typically a bit simpler than the solo piano arrangements because the melody often is where you get a lot of your syncopations and, and, and weird rhythms. Um, what we do in the accompaniment style is we're, we're more focused on the harmony and, and we're going to play a bit simpler. So here's how I would play if there was someone singing. I'm not going to sing it. Ian, want to sing it? <laughs> I'm just putting him on the spot. He's a great singer, but he, he wasn't ready for that. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, I'll show you now what I would do if I was playing with a singer that we'll imagine for now. Okay, and then fast forward and I would go. There we have it. There's my melody version, my accompaniment version with no melody. And Robert, just to emphasize, um, you heard no melody. I was a bit simpler uh, rhythmically in the right hand, focusing on the harmony. You also maybe noticed that I was playing some chords in a two-hand chord voicing, like... or... That's because I'm not playing the melody with the top of my right hand, so I have more room to fill in with a more full harmony. I don't have to sacrifice something like I often do in solo piano performing. Cool? Let's see here. Um, I'm going to check in on the chat very quickly, very, very quickly. Ian's mom is watching. Ian's mom is watching. Shout out to Ian's mom, everyone. She wanted me to sing. She wanted him to sing. <laughs> Let's see if we can get enough votes. If we get 20 people in the chat to say they want to hear Ian sing, maybe he can serenade us. <laughs> Pantera in 12.8. Huh? There you go. I wasn't expecting Pantera today, but that's what I love about music. Is all the genres can work together, and there's room for everything. All right. One more question here. Joe Kuster says, if we went totally crazy for Prelude in C, what classical piece would you recommend, recommend trying next? Just a little bit harder, but every bit as beautiful. Good question. Um, as you guys maybe uh, learned from our wrap-up video, the next piece in the Well-Tempered Clavier is not, <laughs> not one step up. It's several steps up in difficulty. So we won't be doing the fugue in C. Um, I think one of my favorite accessible classical piano pieces might be the uh, Chopin E minor Nocturne, the Prelude. It's a nocturne, right? It's, I'm, I'm, I actually have to pull up the notation, but I'm gonna like do a. Ver this is. I'm gonna regret this, but it's like. Yeah. Some, it has that kind of a feel, and the harmony is really cool. It, it changes by like a half step or two each time. 
uh, a really beautiful piece. I might recommend that, but um, I'm going to have to follow up with our resident classical expert, Wee Chen, and see if she has <laughs> a better example. I do believe that the Chopin E minor is in the app. Excellent. Andrew confirms. Okay, good. Andrew confirmed it. I want everyone to check that out. Don't be intimidated by the notation when you first see it. Even the advanced version, the real version, um, it's not going to be a day one rookie level piece, but I think even some, some, some further along rookies and some, some intermediate players for sure are going to be able to access that piece. Uh, it's a fun one. All right, so let's see here. Um, let's go to another pop quiz. Pop quiz number two. And we are going to... Here's going to be a question for you guys. I've mentioned this several times. Let's see how many people are, are listening and, and paying attention. Andrew is our support team guru. And Andrew is also a musician. What are, is one instrument that Andrew plays? Piano doesn't count because we all play piano here. There are two in particular that he is professionally getting paid to go play shows like in the area and he's one of them was his major. Who knows an instrument that Andrew plays? By the way, while you're, while you're waiting or while you're typing, a little trick that I like to do when I'm making up music um, and when I want to get a spooky, dissonant, scary, you know, kind of interval is I will often play half steps together. And sometimes I like to put a note on top. Feel free to experiment with that. I like to. Answers. Two correct answers. Hey, nice. Everyone said guitar. Um, pian he does play piano, but we're not going to count that. The correct answer. <laughs> Sarah Pickles said the hurdy-gurdy. <laughs> Maybe he does play the hurdy-gurdy. I'm not aware, but um, yeah. Charles Smith says Andrew is actually Billy Joel. <laughs> I wish. Um, the correct answer is Andrew has trum a trombone, he's a trombone uh, major, but well, not a major, he's graduated with a trombone degree, so trombone is correct. He also is a professional drummer too, you guys, so the correct answer were trumpet, and, uh, excuse me, no, there was, oh, trombone, I see. John had trombone, that's it. So John Anderson, trombone, you win two song credits. And Pete, Pete Candelar Candelario, awesome name, halloween -y name. Um, the other answer was drums. Pete, you're getting two free song credits for that too. Uh, Andrew's in the house, you guys. All right, well, Aiden, why don't you come back up to me here. Now I'm just going to get my cost. no more costumes, just my natural self here. Just want to get a, a little serious note here and just say that we really appreciate you guys and the sense of community that we feel here at Playground Sessions, not just on the YouTube channel, but in our Facebook community, within the interactive app. I encourage everyone to continue to share uh, progress videos of whatever you're working on on social. We love here in the team, we love to see any and all of those things. We often share them around with each other and say, how great is this? And as we're getting our costumes finalized between now and Halloween, I would love for you guys to share uh, a, a video of yourselves playing something, anything on the piano, in costume, okay? Well, let me get my hair out of my face here a little bit. And let's see what kind of costumes we can, we can get. Obviously, I hope I don't need to say everything needs to be appropriate and kid-friendly, but let's see what we can do, um, because I think it's fun to share, it's fun to get into the spirit. Um, and with that, I'll say goodbye, I'll say trick-or-treat, Bye, Gemma. If you're still watching, I'll see you at home soon. <laughs>